here. This would be my title slide. And um, I'd like to say to everyone, I'm sorry that I can't be there in person, but um, Hurricane Florence has gotten the best of North Carolina. And I live right in the middle of North Carolina, and we're still experiencing bands of wind and rain and power loss. So I hope we don't have any problems here during this presentation. But um, I simply was unable to get out of Durham, North Carolina to get there, unfortunately. Let's move to the second slide. This is the slide that says myotonic dystrophy type 1 overview. This is just reiterating uh, several of the things that you all already know about in terms of type 1 myotonic dystrophy. Our particular interest has been in the early onset forms of myotonic dystrophy, and in particular, the congenital onset form, which is ultra rare with an incidence of 1 in 4. 3,000. It is serious. It's life-threatening. There are no treatments that are available for either the congenital or any form of DM1, as you know. And with regard to the biology, I'm not going to go through again the, the biology that's been explained by other speakers that underlies the pathophysiology of all types of uh, DM1, including congenital DM1. But one of the new parts of the science story that has emerged is that GSK3 beta, which is an important intracellular enzyme in both muscle cells and neurons, it turns out that that's overactive in myotonic dystrophy patients. And there's been several lines of inquiry and investigation that have confirmed this. And it's suggested that the use of an inhibitor of GSK3 beta could be therapeutic or would have therapeutic potential. So the medicine that I'm working on with my team that we'll talk about here is AMO02, and it is an irreversible GSK3 beta inhibitor. I'm going to move, move on to the next slide. This is slide three. So what we have done with regard to organizing ourselves uh, on the preclinical side is we've been working over the past two to three years, actually three years, with Professor Luba Timchenko out of Cincinnati Children's Hospital. And she has been, with Dr. Timchenko, we've put together three different platforms to confirm that AMO02 has the prospect of being uh, efficacious and helpful to individuals with myotonic dystrophy type 1. The, the first platform has involved primary myoblasts or muscle cell precursors from congenital DM1 patients and from healthy children. And then we've also utilized the two key most models that have been talked about at this meeting, including the HSA uh, knockout or transgenic mouse model that recapitulates many aspects, particularly the, the muscular aspects of adult DM1. And then we've also uh, used the DM-SXL mouse model, which recapitulates uh, the broader phenotype that's present in the early onset forms, and in particular, the congenital form of DM1. The next slide is slide four, and this slide says uh, AMO02, Summary of Preclinical Efficacy in DM1. But the conclusions that we've reached from the preclinical investigations, primarily with Dr. Timchenko, include the fact that AMO02 in those assays does uh, improve the reduced differentiation of the muscle cell precursors for the human myoblasts. And in particular, it affects several of these key molecular targets that I think have been touched upon to date, including BIN1. Uh, a single dose of AMO02 has a positive effect on skeletal muscle histopathology in the HSA mice. AMO02 also is correcting, does in the preclinical assay, corrects this molecular pathway that includes CUG binding protein that's turned out to be very material to the, the key pathophysiology in myotonic dystrophy. And the twice-weekly dosing of AMO02 in the HSA mice improves the functionality, the grip strength. And then dosing in the DM-SXL mice improve, improves uh, survival as well as motor function. So these, we've got multiple lines of converging evidence that suggested it would be a very good idea to try this drug in a clinic, and that's what we did. So slide number five says AMO02, phase two clinical study, study design. So this is just recapitulating what I presented last year at this conference. And um, in essence, this study, which we simply call the 001 study, it was the first clinical trial that was devoted to this early onset segment of DM1 patients, and in particular, uh, young uh, adolescents and young adults that had the congenital form of myotonic dystrophy. There were two, ind three individuals in the study that had childhood onset. 
The study occurred in Newcastle at a single site. The age of the 16 participants was 13 to 34 years of, of age. And the study design involved a single blind placebo lead-in with a 12-week uh, treatment period of fixed dose of either 400 milligrams administered by mouth, so orally, once each morning or 1,000 milligrams. And the outcome measures in this study included looking at plasma levels for pharmacokinetic assessment. We used rating scales that I'll elaborate upon in just a moment. They were completed by clinicians, caregivers, and the patients themselves. And then there were performance-based or functional measures that will be familiar to many of you all. And then we did uh, the usual and customary um, sweep through safety and tolerability assessment, including looking at changes in vital signs, laboratory values, and ECGs. The next slide is slide six, and this slide says AMO02 MD2 study safety and tolerability results. So to get to the results then from this uh, phase two study, the drug was generally safe and well tolerated. There were no early discontinuations due to adverse events. There were no dose adjustments of the study medicine that were needed. The most common adverse event or side effect in the study was nasopharyngitis. Nasopharyngitis is congestion. It's the symptoms of a common cold. None of these symptoms of, of nasopharyngitis were deemed to be related to the study medication. There was one adverse event that was of severe intensity that was knee pain and an individual that was taking 400 milligrams per day, although it was declared to not be related to the study medication. And, and, and finally, there were no systematic irregularities or issues in terms of ECGs, vital signs, or laboratory assessments. The next slide is slide seven. This says AMO02, MD2001 study efficacy results. And this is just recapitulating what we found in terms of efficacy or clinical benefit. So in short, AMO02, the study drug, it did render clinical benefit to the majority of the subjects after 12 weeks of treatment. That benefit was more obvious and more apparent on the higher dose, on the 1,000 milligrams per day as compared and con contrasted with the lower dose, which was 400 milligrams per day. That's exactly what we want to see in a bioactive drug. We always want to see a dose response effect and or a PKPD effect. I'll elaborate upon that in just a minute. The improvements that were seen were most evident in the participants' cognitive functioning, their fatigue, their ability to perform their activities of daily living, as well as in the neuromuscular symptoms of several of the subjects. And in addition, co-occurring autism symptoms improved in several subjects. I will talk about why that's important in, in just a minute. Now, phenotypic variability at baseline, so before the study drug was started, limited the informativeness of some of, several of the performance-based or functional neuromuscular assessments. Translated into plain English, what that means, and, and I spoke about this at the last, uh, last year's conference, is that with regard to things like grip strength or um, respiratory functioning, there was a lot of variability at baseline with regard to the actual levels of impairment of the participants. And so what that meant is working with mean data in a small study, there were only 16 participants, was going to be very challenging. As a consequence, we ended up leaning more heavily on composite-based approaches and in essence, in this study, that meant the rating scale. So the most informative assessments of efficacy were the clinician completed and the caregiver completed rating scales. I say composite assessments because these were assessments or rating scales that surveyed symptoms from head to toe um, for the individuals that were in the study. Um, these rating scales revealed large treatment-associated effect sizes. The effect sizes were statistically significant when looked at across time, and they were coherent, meaning that the changes that were observed ran in parallel with one another. The next slide is slide eight. This is a busy slide. It says AMO02 MD2001 on study efficacy results. Sorry about the small font on this slide, but it basically gives you a Kind of one-stop shopping appreciation of exactly what transpired in terms of efficacy. On the left, the two panes on the left reflect the clinician completed rating scale at the top, and then below it is the caregiver or parent completed rating scale. And then to the right of it are the two global ratings. One 
the, the top pane addresses the phenotype of myotonic dystrophy for each individual, and the one below it is looking at the co-occurring autism symptoms. And what this is showing is a coherent picture of clinical betterment that's transpiring across time. The, the first part of the curves are indicating what the placebo effect was like. And in essence, it was, it was essentially negligible. And then on the right, we have a couple of graphs that look at the top right is preferred walking speed. Uh, and it's just uh, indicating that preferred walking speed, when looked at at a group level, also improved. The effect was more apparent at that 1,000 milligram dose level. is confirming that we had biomarker engagement of the uh, biological target, GSK3 beta, where we saw that the responders had a more pronounced inhibition than the non-responders. This slide number nine is giving you some examples of the database commentaries of what transpired for these participants or subjects in this study. And then we just picked out two here, subject 12 and subject 16, to give you some flip or feel for which parts of their signs and symptoms of myotonic dystrophy improved. Again, levels of alertness improved, degree of social engagement. Uh, for individuals that had walking impairment like subject 12, there was improvement in, in walking speed. And then the capacity to function more independently, I think, was observed as a consistent feature for many of these individuals that improved clinically in the study. So subject, uh, um, slide number 10 is the conclusions that we reached in the wake of this. So we felt that these results were very affirming in terms of the efficacy signal that we saw coupled with the safety and tolerability picture. Uh, and we believe that AMO2 represents a potential treatment for congenital and childhood onset DM1 and that further studies are warranted. A key uh, aspect of this study that I think represents an innovation that we hope has been, is being helpful to the field is the development of a clinician completed rating scale uh, um, that basically occurred across a two and a half to three year arc. And it's, it was derived from a previously validated scale that many of you know, the MD high um, that was crafted after natural history studies and intervention studies uh, were done in, in other forms of model myotonic dystrophy. This, this rating scale that I just talked about, it's also being validated um, right now in an ongoing natural history study in children and adolescents with congenital DM1 that's being led by Dr. Nick Johnson. And it was really refined in working with Dr. Johnson, working with Dr. Chad Heatwell, who is the key author of the MD High, and then working very collaboratively with the FDA over the past two and a half years. We have uh, refined and, and developed this rating scale, which I'll touch upon in, in more detail in just a moment. But this, this rating scale is going to serve as the primary outcome measure in our forthcoming phase two, three registration caliber study in children and adolescents with the congenital form of myotonic dystrophy. Uh, registration caliber means that this is a large study. If it's positive, successful, positive, then it would be appropriate to file an NDA, which is a new drug application. This study is going to begin imminently. In fact, we begin our site initiation uh, process next uh, eight days from now. So it really is uh, just about to begin. The title of this study that I just discussed is on slide 11. It's a long title. And slide 12 uh, which says AM002 MD 2003 study overview. Um, the acronym that we use internally is the 003 study. So I'll refer to it as the 003 study moving forward. This is a phase two, three randomized, double blind, placebo controlled study. It's just about to start. Uh, we'll be recruiting six to 16 year old uh, children and adolescents with a diagnosis of congenital myotonic dystrophy, 56 subjects is the target enrollment. We'll be working with sites in the U.S., the U.K., and Canada. Approximately five to ten subjects, we think, will be enrolled per site, and the randomization will be one-to-one -one so that there'll be 28 individuals randomized to uh, active drug and 28 to placebo, and then we're going to stratify the enrollment between uh, children and adolescents. The next slide is slide 13. This is just uh, spelling out some more details about this 003 study design. There'll be a two to four week screening period, 22 week 
double-blind placebo-controlled uh, treatment phase, and then there'll be a two-week follow-up period, or the participants will have an opportunity to enroll in an extension study, which I'll elaborate upon in just a moment. The next slide is slide 14. This is AMO02, MD2003 study endpoints. And the primary endpoint, as I've just been saying in this study, the primary efficacy measure is going to be this clinician-completed congenital DM1 rating scale. I'll show you that in just a moment, what that looks like. The key secondary endpoint will be the CGII, which is the Clinical Global Impression Improvement Scale. This is used widely in neurology and psychiatry studies. The FDA is very comfortable with it. It's a simple one through seven scale that clinicians find generally quite user-friendly. And then we have a suite of secondary endpoints, including the uh, top three caregiver concerns, visual analog scale score. So this is um, the same rating scale that we used in that study that I spoke about that uh, our first study in Newcastle, where we had both the patients and the caregivers, which in that study it was the parents, uh, completing a three-item self-chosen highest priority items related to myotonic dystrophy. They were rating that on a 10 centimeter scale. Uh, that showed a good signal in that first study, and we're recapitulating it and, or re -bring, bring it back in as a key endpoint in this study. There'll also be a caregiver-completed uh, version of this new rating scale that I've been talking about, and that's called the CCCDM1-RS. And then um, the other key secondary endpoint I've mentioned here is DEXA scanning, which is a low-intensity X-ray that we'll look at changes in lean muscle mass during the course of the uh, st study. The next slide is slide number 15. This is just elaborating uh, a bit upon the different items and uh, of the clinician completed congenital DM1 rating scale that will serve as the primary efficacy measure in this study. There are 11 items. These should be very familiar to individuals that have seen the MD high, that have read the PRISM1 uh, paper that got published by Dr. Heatwell in the wake of a pioneering that MD high. It's the same basic head-to-toe um, items that are common in the phenotype of type 1 myotonic dystrophy, whether it's children, adolescents, or adults. So I'm not going to read off all these items, but these should be classic issues for, for individuals that um, understand the, the varying clinical presentation. But it ranges from limitations with walking all the way down to the difficulties with thinking, impaired sleep, choking issues. The, the graph on the right is just reiterating that. We used a slightly longer version of this scale in the Newcastle study, the 001 Newcastle study. We did an analysis with the 17 items in that version, and we confirmed that the 11 items that are being brought forward into this more refined, slightly shorter version of the scale for this study, they in fact carried the efficacy signal in that first study in Newcastle. So it helped us to feel more comfortable that uh, we were doing the right thing here. And this was, again, strongly influenced by the advisement and collaboration of the Division of Neurology Products at the FDA. The next slide is slide 16. And um, this is just reiterating that for each of these items, they get rated on a zero through four um, Likert scale of severity. Zero is the symptoms not present or no longer present. It goes all the way up to a rating scale score of four, which would be for very severe. The total score on this 11-item rating scale can range from zero to 44. We think it's reasonably user-friendly. It's been reasonably straightforward in terms of achieving a coherent study culture in the preliminary training that we've done with this version. And um, this is going to... I, hopefully this will be helpful and, and user-friendly for parents as well because there's a companion version that the parents or caregivers will be completing also. Slide number 17 is uh, just a, a elaborating upon the exploratory endpoints in this study. These will be familiar measures for those of you that are familiar with clinical trials or just clinical assessment in younger people with myotonic dystrophy. So the 10-meter walk-run will be in there and then a measurement of lip strength um, the CC uh, MD high will be in this study. And then we have a suite of um, relatively low burden, easy to use cognitive assessments that are done on the iPad, including the NIH toolbox dimensional change card sort test and then the picture sequence test memory. 
and the PPVT. And then at the bottom of the slide here, you see the biomarkers that we'll be assessing in this study, including blood-based GSK3 beta levels. We'll be looking at changes in phosphorylation um, in that biomarker, and then we'll be uh, looking at changes in relevant RNA targets in blood-based samples. But then we're also going to be doing in select individuals muscle tissue RNA through uh, needle biopsy at uh, well-qualified sites to look at changes in RNA in the tissue itself. And then lastly, we'll be doing pharmacokinetics, uh, looking at the blood levels of AMOO2 um, and looking at changes across time and seeing how that might correlate relate with uh, changes in efficacy measures and safety and tolerability. So the safety and tolerability endpoints in this study are, are the usual customary things like uh, soliciting for adverse events and then looking in a serial basis at any changes that might occur in laboratory values, ECGs, vital signs, and, and also bone mineral density. As I mentioned, we're doing DEXA scanning uh, in this study. The, there'll be a follow-on study to this as well. So there, we have an extension study, as I'd mentioned, for the participants in this OO3 study. It's a 32-week extension study, same suite of outcome measures. It has the same age range because the participants will be coming from the preceding OO3 study. So fi uh, 56 subjects up to 10 study sites. And they'll be randomized in a blinded manner, one-to-one, -one, to either 1,000 milligrams or 600 milligrams which is a slightly lower dose, to give us some insight into the potential utility of a slightly lower dose than we'll be using in the preceding O3 study. Slide number 20 uh, shows you the study design in a graphic manner for this extension study. So in essence, it's got a four-week uh, double-blind up titration period, a 28-week double-blind maintenance period, and a two-week follow-up period. So for participants in the preceding OO3 well, study, uh, if they enroll into this extension study, they'll have treatment for uh, up to a year, a uh, continuous treatment uh, with uh, AMO2, which, which if it's effective and it's well tolerated, will be, we think, a, a good value proposition for uh, families and for, for their affected children. The next slide is slide 21. I just wanted to very briefly say to the audience here that we did complete um, through an investigator-initiated trial a study in autism that um, was of interest to us because GSK3 beta, which again is the druggable target that's affected by AMOO2, it does, it does play a very material role in terms of autism and neurodevelopmental disorders. So this study was co-occurring when we did the study in Newcastle. It was a larger study, a phase two double-blind placebo-controlled study that had 40 per group, 12-week treatment period that um, involved up titration from 400 to 1,000 milligrams per day. And it used um, a variety of uh, efficacy endpoints, primarily rating scales, which is usual and customary in autism studies, including the aberrant behavior behavior checklist and the violent adaptive behavior scales, the repetitive behavior scale. Also had a biomarker analysis, and that's on slide, this is slide 22 that I'm on right now. And slide 23 is a single picture snapshot of the efficacy results in, in the TIDE study. I'm sorry that this is um, looking somewhat congested, but I tried to get the key results into a single slide. The dotted line is placebo, the solid line is AMOO2, and you can see here that it, it's clear that the clinical benefit, um, the AMOO2 uh, outperformed placebo on these various different outcome measures. The lower right-hand corner it is also confirming that there was direct biomarker engagement as well. It's looking at phosphorylated levels of another enzyme that's quite um, key and directly influenced by GSK3 beta, this other enzyme is AKT. And there was a very clear change in the phosphorylation level in that. So this is giving us uh, reasons to believe um, that the drug would also uh, have potential efficacy or utility in an autism population. We're still thinking about what to do with this data. Our primary focus at the current time, though, is on uh, myotonic dystrophy and on the OO3 study that I had uh, that I covered here. So the next slide, slide 24, just says questions. I just want to thank people for listening. 